This new research is going to help us identify what the sweet spot is for building muscle, how much recovery you should truly have between your training days. Now, full disclaimer, the research we're going to look at today is new. It's done in rodents, so you can't 100% take it to the bank. But here's what I wanna share first. If we only look at evidence and we only look at human models all the time, a lot of times we don't get the ideas that we need to push science forward. So don't hate on the rodent model research because as far as mechanisms are concerned, it's really opening our eyes to things. And this particular study actually validates a lot of what the performance and muscle building community has kind of known for a while, but now we're able to put a little bit more mechanism behind it. Okay, we've known for a long time that overtraining can decrease performance. We have only really speculated that overtraining is going to actually affect hypertrophy. Because before we thought overtraining would only affect hypertrophy because your strength would go down, because your performance would go down. Well, it seems as though there's more to it than just that. And it's fascinating and it gives us a lot of insight as to how we can change our training programming. After this video, I also put a link for our sponsor, LMNT, Element Electrolytes. That link gets you a free sample variety pack of all the flavors along with any purchase. So you get a free variety pack with the citrus salt, with the mango chili, with the chocolate, with the unflavored, you get all those flavors free with any purchase. So that link is down below. Again, they are a big sponsor on this channel. It's 1000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium, and it's the one that I drink every day when I'm training. There's no calories in some of them and less than five calories in some of the flavored ones. So they're totally fasting friendly. You can drink them if you're doing a fasted workout and they keep your appetite in check because they taste delicious and it's something fun to enjoy. So that link down below underneath this video. So the study we're talking about was published in Physiology Reports. Took a look at 21 rats divided into three groups. Group one trained every 72 hours resistance training. Group two trained every 24 hours with resistance training. And group three trained every eight hours with resistance training. Okay, they did muscle biopsies 48 hours after all their sessions were complete. So each group did a total of 18 sessions. Once those were completed, 48 hours later, they looked at muscle cross-sectional area, they looked at muscle weight, they did biopsies and measured all the chemicals and everything in their, in their muscles. Very interesting stuff. The findings were fascinating. In the 72 hour and the 24 hour group, there was significant hypertrophy after 18 sessions, significant muscle growth and only slight activation of degradation systems. So only slight activation of what would start to degrade proteins. However, in the eight hour group, there was none, not a zilch hypertrophy and major activation of these degradation systems. Now we need to unpack this more because this is very blanket, but on the surface we see, okay, training too much definitely blunted the growth, but let's look more. The 72 hour and the 24 hour groups, the groups that had longer breaks, they ended up having increases in torque, their muscle torque, their force, over the course of the entire 18 sessions. In step ladder fashion, they got stronger, essentially more torque. The eight hour group saw an increase up to the fourth session, and then they plateaued for the rest of the entire 14 sessions after that. They plateaued no change. So a quick ramp up and then burn. The eight hour group also had less total impulses. So less kind of opportunity to grow in a sense, if you want to put it like that. But the other thing they looked at is they looked at the muscle wet weight in the cross-sectional area. And this is how you kind of measure size. The 24 hour group and the 72 hour group had significantly more wet weight and denser cross-sectional area and more cross-sectional area. Once again, the eight hour group in this case None, nothing. What was very wild though, we're gonna get a little fancy here for just a second, is there's this thing called mTOR. You've probably heard me talk about it if you watch this channel a lot. And if you haven't subscribed already, do hit that subscribe button because you'll learn this kind of stuff. mTOR is a growth signal, okay? When we spike mTOR through eating protein or through resistance training, it's a pro-growth signal. What was interesting is that mTOR was elevated the most in the eight hour group even though the eight hour group had no muscle growth. 
So we know that mTOR wasn't the issue in question because it would make sense. mTOR spiked when you resistance trained. So the fact that they were resistance training closer, they probably had a higher stack of mTOR, but that didn't seem to impact muscle. So mTOR is not the end all be all. Let's keep going. There was more AMPK activation in the eight hour group. Well, at least as far as downstream targets are concerned. And what does that mean in the scientific like, language converted into English? Well, AMPK is the opposite of mTOR. AMPK is when you are so low in fuel, your body starts to pull from other sources and upregulates all these other systems because you're in a deficit. Well, what's wild is that downstream targets of AMPK were only elevated in the eight hour group, but they were also elevated in tandem with mTOR. But there's a good reason for this. The eight hour groups were training so frequently and so close together that their overall energy deficit was more because they were in a more depleted state by the time they entered their next workout and they were just continually depleting, depleting, depleting because they were never getting adequate recovery in between. Probably the most important part of this entire paper is what I'm about to share. Nuclear factor kappa B, which is the essential like sort of almost top down cascade of inflammation. Nuclear factor kappa B is a transcription factor, travels to a nucleus of a cell, triggers inflammation. Nuclear factor kappa B was elevated more in the eight hour and the 24 hour groups than the 72 hour group. Not a huge, huge surprise because we know that training triggers inflammation, but it was chronically elevated in the eight hour group and mildly elevated in the 24 hour group. And the 72 hour group had a nice modulation of it coming back down. What else was interesting is that the eight hour group had better translocation of nuclear factor kappa B to the nucleus of a cell. Again, in English, what does this mean? It means the body got ruthlessly efficient at stimulating inflammation. So basically the eight hour group, it just got so good. It's like, hey, we're used to being inflamed. Let's just keep upregulating this process and keep this inflammation going. We do not always realize as recreational lifters, worker outers, how much inflammation impedes our muscle growth when it's too much, how much it impedes our metabolic health, how much it affects our brain. You notice when you take a couple of days off, even though it's really hard from a standpoint of building muscle and being in the gym, it's hard. You know you look better after a few days off when you look in the mirror, right? You know it. Don't joke yourself. Your brain might tell you you look smaller and you're losing all your gains, but you know deep down you look better and you feel more refreshed when you get back in the gym. But what do we take away from this? These are rats and they were doing isometrics, not even like full on heavy volume. Because what's interesting here is we noticed that there was no 48 hour group. There's a 24 and 72. And I will make a note that the 72 hour group was slightly better, slightly more muscle, slightly better torque all markers slightly better in the 72 hour group. 24 hour group was great. Maybe the sweet spot is 48 hours. However, this is looking at isometric contractions, which are largely much less stressful than a traditional higher volume or even moderate volume resistance training regimen. So if you're training even conditionally, like normally or traditionally, I should say, like a normal like 10 to 20 sets or something, I don't know, 10 to 30 sets. Well, you might find that 24 hours is not enough because at that point you are putting even more demand on. If 24 hours is already showing a slight negative impact with this overall isometric group, traditional weight training might even need more. However, this is for muscle building. One thing that we're definitely seeing with this though, is let's say you train in the evening one day and then you go to bed and you train in the morning the next day. It seems as though this is not a good habit. It seems as though it might work occasionally if it's a one-off situation, but you are much better off if you have to lift in the afternoon to do cardio in the morning and not resistance strain. Do something that's gonna lower inflammation because at the end of the day, if muscle growth is your goal, you want a little bit of inflammation right after your workout and then you wanna bring it down. And the only way you're gonna bring it down is with rest or active recovery. Do your cardio, do your zone two cardio, do it, it's good for you, and it will help modulate the inflammation. As far as big compound movements go, if you're doing any kind of full body type of training, you may wanna consider every other day. Every other day doing full body routines so you get adequate recovery. Now, one thing that was not factored in here was their diet. 
could you influence recovery a little bit more with more protein? You absolutely could. We can't look at it in this data, but that is one caveat here with this study. So if they were all eating the same thing, this is what happened. They were eating typical rat chow, okay? But if you came in and you said, I'm gonna double my protein intake, you could help some of that ubiquitin proteasome sort of degradation system. So what I would recommend here is going every other day resistance training, every other day sort of a cardio fashion, and increasing your protein to 0.8 to 1.3 grams of protein per pound of body weight. If you are a bigger person with a little extra fat on you, lean towards that 0.8. If you're a skinnier person, lean towards that 1.3 grams per pound of body weight. What we are seeing out of this though, is that recovery is much, much, much more important. It is now about finding the minimum effective dose versus trying to find how much volume you can stack on. We know cellularly like what's happening and even metabolically with our HRV and all kinds of things, what's happening to us when we overtrain. But we do it anyway. But when you have the hard data that suggests your actual performance, your actual muscle is not going to improve, you are far better off reducing how often you resistance train and focus on your intensity and focus on your recovery and your nutrition. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.